Hello, everybody. We are here with Margaret Bayou, the director of And So I Begin, short film which will be competing at uh, Accessible Film Festival International Short Film Competition. Hello, Margaret. How are you? Hello, merhaba. Thank you so much. <laughs> Having us. <laughs> we're really glad you're with us today and we really appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, give some information about Margaret. Uh, Margaret is an award winning filmmaker and founder of independent film production company Myra Entertainment in New York, London, and Singapore and producing global, non-violent, and inclusive content. Productions have included Academy Award winning Call, Call Me By Your Name, which many of you uh, presumably know about it, The Work to Come, and Benediction. Margaret has written and directed two short films, Telling a You and La Pardon, which screened at festivals around the globe. She also founded Myra Photography, as well as the Myra Initiative in New York, the Flar philanthropic arm of Myra Entertainment, supporting children in crisis and promoting nonviolent cinema. Wow, that's great. That's great. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add to this? Oh, no, that was <laughs> far too much already. Thank you. <laughs> Margaret, first of all, I want to start uh, by uh, learning about the story of the background story of this film. Can you tell, tell us about the film's journey? How did the story evolve and how were you inspired? And you can also talk a little bit about the, the movie too. Sure. Well, thank you so, so much. So this little short film is truly microscopic, but it's very dear to my heart for a great many reasons. And quite frankly, you know, it started out as any little story does, you know, but I was inspired by, um, um, in this specific case, the works of American painter Edward Hopper, who, as you know, lived between the 1880s and 1960s. I love him he, very much. Yeah, Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. And, you know, his artwork, just for those who don't know his work, um, you know, he's very well known for having painted those wonderful, very serene, quiet, arguably lonely uh, moments, you know, yeah. also seemingly random moments of people, uh, oftentimes lone figures at cafes, theaters, um, at, the, at the petrol station pumping, you know, petrol uh, in landscapes, but also through windows. And it's a sort of, um, you know, artistic voyeurism um, that is unique, I feel, and something that is very um, special because I, I always felt he, he wasn't really stalking his subjects. He was really understanding them. You know, there was a certain compassion about his viewpoint. And that's been, you know, uh, an artist that I've grown up with and always admired. And, and that coupled with my interest in human behavior and the whole idea of, of looking at humans that are disconnected, you know, whether it's geographically or, you know, in any, any sense of the word um, that are not together, but, you know, might have something in common has always been uh, fascinating to me. And so I wanted to do a side by side study, um, but I wanted to take it a step further and say, all right, well, we can do that. But what would happen if those different characters were in addition also, you know, in different eras? So we picked three different eras for three neighbors in one building that are living next door to each other. Um, and they're in different eras, yet so close together. So they're separated by walls and time. And over the course of the very short 11 minutes of that film, we find out what they actually have in common. And as it turns out, they are absolutely intimately connected. So that's sort of been a thesis uh, and a, a bit of a, a you know, uh, interest that I've been thinking about. And this was before the pandemic, you know? And so funnily enough, the pandemic, of course, and we can talk about that later perhaps, um, became this bizarre echo, you know, of what we always, uh, always envisioned, this study of human behavior. So that's really how it came about. So we set out, created this wonderful little team in New York and shot it in New Jersey, all very small, modest, humble, you know, but full of heart, uh, sat down with the actors, showed them Edward Hopper paintings, they understood it, it was wonderful, we shot it, everything was fabulous, and then something happened, but again, we can talk about that okay. as well. Okay, uh, I was just going to ask you about uh, being a semi-animated short 
film. Mm -hmm. It is really a piece of art. You actually said why it was uh, it was inspired by Edward Hopper uh, paintings, and it, it's really colorful and dynamic. And what was the reason you chose to create the story this way? I mean, okay, you love Edward Hopper, but is there another special reason for you to choose this type of um, reflecting the story? Mm -hmm. A uh, great question, because it is somewhat unusual. I think it's officially even an experimental film. I'm, yeah, I'm learning exactly. now. It's sort of its own little thing. Yeah. There are but, no uh, many examples of what you did, uh, I think, uh, I guess, yeah. That's right. That's right. Absolutely no. Um, so basically what happened was very unromantic because we were in post-production with our little film, all happy, all exhausted, but, you know, feeling very good about it. And then, you know, the ultimate nightmare of any filmmaker happened, which was a near total loss of all of our high resolution files. Oh my God. <laughs> I wasn't now, expecting th this. <laughs> awful, just awful. So, you know, the whole team was crushed as you can imagine. And I mean, no, no small little indie film has the budget to redo it, you know. Yeah. The, big, the big films can do that, but little films can't do that one chance to tell it. And so, you know, we didn't know what to do. This was six years ago. So we ended up with those basically unusable files and we literally shelved them. We put them away, had to step back and thought, well, you know, we meant well, but this is never going to see the light of day. And then the pandemic happened, which of course I don't need to explain. We've all been through it collectively. And, you know, our little team kind of got you know, thought about that little film again and thought, you know, this, this is actually, this is what we're, we're artists, you know, this, this is what we can do. We can, this is a challenge, you know, let, let's find a solution to this. So the team and I, we, we brainstormed and came up with the idea of um, extending the frames basically with animation, thereby making the film high resolution again, you know, animation sort of became the knight in shining armor, if you will. And we thought, you know, if we couple those two, we can save the little film. We can embed our low resolution files that fill this much of the screen and then extend it with animation. And that could be the um, solution. And sure enough, I mean, we did exactly that. We found a wonderful um, animation studio in London, Liquid, who were so kind to take on this tiny project. And we had worked with them before and something else. So we, we knew each other and we knew that they would understand and they were very, very generous and, and thoughtful. And um, anyway, we worked together, found a solution frame by frame, scene by scene, um, literally framing our little pieces um, and um, running into new challenges in terms of how so certain tracking shots had to be dealt with animation and things like that. So it became sort of a whole new level of creative challenges. But as a team, and a film team is always a giant village. It's never just one person. Um, we, you know, we overcame it and then, uh, um, you know, put it together. And I have to say, I, I think it's much better now. So basically, the lesson from all of that is that an accident can sometimes really be a catalyst, you know? And I think that was also a really nice lesson in life and a nice example, especially for an artist. When you think you're, you're at rock bottom, it's like, all right, you know, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's see, you know, we'll, we're up for it. Took a bit of time, but that was fine. Exactly, and uh, you said that it wasn't a really a romantic story, but I, I, for me, it's one of the most romantic filmmaking stories I ever heard, actually. It's such a beautiful story you're telling us right now. And like you said, I really believe, and we talked about this with some other directors too, because of the pandemic era and uh, maybe from, because of other obstacles, we talked about this too. Always, I think, uh, certain restrictions uh, result in really creative works. So I guess what you're telling is really important because you had a really um, maybe hard time because of what happened, but now there is a magnificent, like a really precious and unique film. So it wouldn't happen maybe if uh, the the files weren't lost. So true, yeah. they 
apparently they were meant to be lost. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's a really romantic story. I mean, <laughs> I have to say that. Um, and I also want to talk uh, about time with you because I'm really, really interested in time. And I, I was always fascinated with films that talk about time and explain time and con connection between time. So I want to ask you, uh, you said that I had always fascinated with the idea of time and its direction of travel, you said. So yes. uh, can you tell us about the characters and how they are connected through time and space? I mean, you told a little bit about the story, but I, I want to hear a little bit more about why they were um, together, why they were connected, what, what inspired you? Sure. So again, you know, um, considering the viewpoint of Hopper, if I may be so bold to, for a split second, put me even into the same category as this wonderful man, um, you know, we, we try to approach the same thing. We're looking at three neighbors who live in the same building next door to each other, um, but they're completely unaware of each other, not just because there are walls between them, but because they live in three entirely different eras, 1900s, we're in the 1940s and present time. And, um, you know, what interested us was this, this study of, you know, first of all, the study of human behavior when you're alone, unobserved, you know, when you're alone with your thoughts, with your dreams, with your fears, with your hopes, all of that. But then, you know, the question, does that change if you are in a different era? You know, how, 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 does, the, how, how does time basically and, and, and different um, moments in time affect behavior? That was interesting. And so we picked those three artists, they're a writer, a ballerina, and a painter. The writer being in the 40s, the ballerina present day, and the painter around the 1900s. Um, and, and basically left them to, you know, their own devices. We kind of, they had to improvise a lot, the actors, they did really well. We basically briefed them and they had to figure out what they were doing. Um, and then as it turned out, they, through the art, they were all connected, but not just, you know, in, in terms of linear time, as in the person who lived you know, in, in the past had an impact on the person who lived later. But as it turns out, also the other way around, there was a certain influence and an impact, as you um, can see in the film. Yeah. And that concept was an abstract one like six years ago. Um, but it we, we like the idea of, of really thinking of time, not just being linear, but more as a... Um, you know, looking at it more as a, as a compass, really, of um, events that don't necessarily have to happen in order, if that makes yeah. any sense. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, exactly. I, I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And then, please. Yeah, yeah. Please, please continue. I will ask later. No, no. Okay. Um, and, and funnily enough, as mentioned earlier, you know, this happened before the pandemic, and then the pandemic happened, which kind of echoed back and then of course our resolving of all of that came after the pandemic you know last year but technically speaking after so it it, it sort of became its own back and forth echo of this little story how uh, we kind of unknowingly kind of almost uh, imagined the future you know and then the future having an impact on what we did in the past and then how we fixed the past for the future so it just sort of came this interesting yeah. game. basically our whole theory um became alive you know it, it yeah, was quite yeah uh, and see. i guess the film is more meaningful like you said maybe six years ago it wouldn't have the maybe same impact on the audience but right now uh, with the all the things we've been through uh, last couple of years i think it has a more meaningful more impactful uh, effects on everybody so i guess the film chose its own time uh, to come out and uh, to show itself i guess and also you said that you let the uh, actors just improvise and maybe find their own way of expressing those characters because i was also gonna ask there are no dialogues in the film 
And yes. that's always a challenge when you try to ex explain something. That's always a challenge because uh, it's not always possible to show everything you want. But also when you can, maybe it's, an, it's another dimension, another creativity in a film. So it, was that the reason you chose not to put any dialogue just for people to maybe watch and find their own story out? On, in the film or was there another reason for that no it was it was basically the 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 um ambition to really let this medium do what it was meant to do which is to portray moving visuals you know that's that's what film is that's the, the power of film you know it, it 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 can preserve moments it can win the race against time is a very powerful medium and a very magnetic one. And I think one that we're all affected by because basically our stories are being recorded and witnessed by film. So I think um, in, in, in terms of the decision of not having a dialogue, it really started out from the idea of creating a painting, if you will. And of course, we never knew I'm so sorry. sorry. I was just going to ask. Uh, I didn't want to uh, lose this moment. Uh, were you planning to do no dialogue film when, when you first shot the film or the, was there any dialogue and uh, they were lost in the files? No, there were never, never dialogues. OK, it was never okay. dialogue. Exactly. Because we approached it like a painting, you know, and we we also felt it is a powerful thing to um having to to you know imagine inner dialogues of people you know we all walk through life and we basically just if we, if we do it at all we listen to other people but we the question is do, do we really listen you know do we really take the time and make the effort to truly listen you know what people are thinking and feeling or do we just walk around and and react to the most obvious emotion you know yeah. um and so no dialogue. We also felt it was, of course, on an artistic level, a, a wonderful challenge, both for the directing as well as for the acting to, to say no dialogue. So tell the story with your body, with your facial expressions. And that was that was great fun for the talent as well. Um, but yes, no dialogue as a almost homage to the inner dialogue that we all have, that other people have, and also as a reminder that there, there's a lot of there are a lot of unspoken words between humans, and that it might be a really good thing to cultivate a certain um, understanding for that, and a certain patience for that, and a certain ear for that, if you will, you know. And, and that fascinated us and became a huge uh, motivator for this way of storytelling. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you for sharing all these information with us. I, I guess after people watch the film, after listening to you, uh, it will be a more meaningful story for them also. Uh, so thank you for here being here with us today, Margaret, and nice to meet you, you again. Oh, and, absolutely. Nice to yeah, you. yeah, and I hope to talk with you uh, for other projects too in the future, I hope. So, That'd be lovely. Yeah, yes. Thank you again. and. See you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Get <laughs> it.